Good evening. It's good to see everybody out here tonight. This evening we'll open up with uh, 514. We'll sing the first and third verse of glory, the Glory Land Way. Um, and then uh, we'll sing one more, and then we'll have an opening prayer led by Glenn Barden. We'll sing one after that, and then turn it back over to Drew, who's here, um, to bring his third lesson of the day on uh, social media and the Christian and how it influences our life. If you hadn't been here this morning and you missed two good services, uh, two good lessons, uh, I think we'll be in for a treat again tonight. <clears throat> Let's sing. I'm in the way, the bright shining way. I'm in the glory land.
I appreciate all of you for being here today. I know this is not the easiest day to get out and be at church. A lot of your number is sick. I know back home we have a lot of folks who are dealing with illness as well. And then the weather has not been very helpful today. But it's great that uh, you are able to be here. And it is an honor to me to be able to, to be here with you and to talk with you again about these matters that are so very important. I didn't mention it this morning, and uh, I hesitate to mention it this evening, but I did bring a few of the books that I wrote on this subject, if anybody's interested in it. I'm not using this as an opportunity to peddle my books, but if you'd like more information on it and you're interested in that, I do have a few with me, and uh, they're also available online. You can go to my website, drewkaiser.com, and find them, and uh, you can get the statistics that I'm using and a lot of the research that I've done, you can find that. It's a little easier to, to look at it in paper form than to try to jot these things down quickly in your notes as I'm preaching. This morning during the class hour, we talked about setting boundaries. Uh, during the worship hour, we talked about what social media does to you personally and to your identity, how you see yourself and how important it is for you to look at yourself the way that God sees you and to listen to those declarations he's made about you in his word. Tonight, I want to talk about what social media does for your health. Uh, we turn to social media as a treatment. Uh, when we're feeling lonely or depressed, we may go there to try to connect with people and to find encouragement. Uh, maybe we're sick and we have some symptoms and we're afraid to go to the doctor, it's inconvenient to go to the doctor, or we're trying to look at new exercise regimens or we're going on a diet. We might go to social media or to the internet in general to get information. Uh, when we're dealing with spiritual matters and challenges, a lot of times we'll turn online to look for a solution. And the irony is that the very thing we turn to to help our health just oftentimes makes it even worse. Have you heard the old, say the old saying that the treatment is worse than the cure? Well, it, it applies, or treatment is worse than the disease. 
Well, that applies in the matter of trying to find treatment with social media. It's not good for your mental health, your physical health, or your spiritual health if you're not putting the proper boundaries on it. And that's what I want to talk about tonight in that order, mental, physical, and spiritual health. Now let's think about it as it pertains to mental health as we begin tonight. Rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed since 2011 so that that generation I was telling you about between the ages of 10 and 27 now are on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades. Many of these people are turning to social media for help and it's just making matters worse. In fact, as I said this morning, the science shows that one hour per day on Facebook decreases your general satisfaction with life by 14%. That's a pretty significant uh, statistic. All, all screens are linked to more unhappiness, and time away from screens are linked to happiness, more happiness. Another statistic said that 8th graders who spend 10 or more hours a week on social media are 56% more likely to say they're unhappy than those who devote less time to social media. And so the, the stats are out there. The research is very clear that something about it is damaging our mental health. Now, I want to look at it a little more closely and ask the question, what is it? about social media that affects our mental health. And there are five factors that I would like for you to consider with me tonight. The first one is envy. We tend to compare when we go online. I shared with you 2 Corinthians 10, 12 this morning where Paul said, comparing themselves with themselves and measuring themselves by themselves, they are not wise. It's not wise to compare yourself with others. Now that was, Paul said that long ago when uh, it was impossible to compare yourself with very many people at one time. Now you can scroll through your news feed and compare yourself with hundreds of people. Just think how much worse the problem is today than it was when Paul was talking about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Envy is a serious problem. I found an excerpt from... Ovid's Metamorphosis, written a long, long time ago, where he pictured envy as a monster. And this is describing the scene where Minerva goes to the house of envy. And his description of envy as a monster just shows the problem of envy so well. I wanted to share it, share it with you. Whenever Minerva arrives at the house of envy, she finds envy feeding on poisonous snakes. It's pretty gross. <laughs> But uh, when she advances in, we read this. When envy advances, she sees the beauty of the goddess and of her armor. She cannot help but groan and makes a face and sighs a wretched sigh. Then she grows pale and her body shrivels up, her glances sidewise, and her teeth are black. Venom from her dinner coats her tongue she only smiles at sight of another's grief, nor does she know, disturbed by wakeful cares, the benefits of slumber. When she beholds another's joy, she falls into decay and rips down only to be ripped apart, herself the punishment for being her. That last part is the part I really wanted you to hear, herself the punishment for being her. Envy's punishment is envy itself. Now if you go to Galatians 5, 19 through 21, you'll get a list of the works of the flesh. And every one of those works of the flesh promises pleasure to some degree or another. It promises pleasure, doesn't always deliver on that. But every one of those sins, except for one, except for the sin of envy, promises some kind of pleasure. Envy is one of the greatest temptations we have, and yet, if you think about it, there's no reward even promised at the beginning of it. The punishment is envy itself. It's very interesting to me how 
taken we are by envy when at the front there are no benefits to it. Our English word envy means to eye another person. And it reminds me of 1 Samuel chapter 18 where uh, Saul and David and the Israelites come back after a victory against the Philistines and the, the women are singing Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands and Saul becomes jealous of David and 1 Samuel 18 verse 9 says Saul kept an eye on David from that day on. That's reflected in the English etymology of the word envy, which is related to the eye, to eye someone with evil intent. And that's what we do a lot of times when we get online, and the envy itself is punishment enough. But there's more. Look in the second place as we think about what this is doing to our mental health. Look at confusion. A lot of us are confused nowadays because of all the information bombarding us from the Internet. I mean, it's hard to make up your mind about something, right? And have you ever made up your mind about something and formed an opinion or formed a, a, a principle that was very important to you only to see it fall apart when it's challenged? All of us have done that. We we've, we've felt really confident about something until we ran into somebody else who felt very confident about the opposite position. And then we get confused and we think, have I been wrong my whole life? Or have I been wrong about this? Have I been teaching the wrong thing? When you're exposed to so much on the internet, that confusion is increased exponentially. Maybe you've heard of the Roman philosopher Seneca. Uh, in a letter he wrote to a, a friend, he says this, You ask me to say what you should consider it particularly important to avoid? My answer is this, a mass crowd. It is something to which you cannot entrust yourself yet without risk. He says, I never come back home with quite the same moral character I went out with. Something or other becomes unsettled where I had achieved internal peace. You get that a lot in social media. The information is not vetted by any accepted source. Everybody has equal say. And you might post something you feel very strongly about, and all these comments come in with people disagreeing with you. And you start to feel like, well, the whole world feels this way. Or maybe this is true. Maybe I'm wrong. That's another problem that you're faced with, and it affects your mental health. We need to be like the Bereans when Paul went to visit them. We have a standard that we can trust, right? We have the Word of God, and we can compare philosophies and teachings and opinions with the Word of God and know what is true when we do that comparison. The Bereans, when Paul preached to them, himself an apostle, they searched the scriptures daily to see whether what he was saying was so. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. That ought to be our attitude as well. Let's look in the third place under mental health at the problem of guilt. I've already discussed the enormous amounts of time that people spend online. Nine hours a day on average, two hours of that usually on social media. That's a lot of time. I think that calculates out to like five years and four months of the average lifespan. A lot of time. And so after we spend all that time online, we sometimes feel guilty about it. Things were not done that should have been done. We neglected friends, relationships. We see how much time and how behind we are in our responsibilities. And all of that guilt is coming from not setting good boundaries like we talked about this morning. Number four, let's talk about victimization. Uh, nobody likes to be bullied, but a lot of people are getting bullied on the Internet. We see rising rates of something called cyberbullying, which is just bullying online. And it can be even worse than bullying in the real world because at least you can run away from a bully and get some peace from him for a little while in the real world. Online, the trolls are chasing you and running after you constantly without a break. And so the more you're online, the more you're exposed to that kind of thing. The hatred and the vitriol is just terrible. Now, if you, in your school days, 
knew where the bully liked to hang out, knew the street corner he liked to hang out. Wouldn't you avoid that street corner on your way to school? I mean, isn't that the smart thing to do? If you're going online and you're encountering bullies, and people have started seeking you out, it's a real problem in your life, let me suggest to you the same thing that you would do in a real-world situation. Avoid the place where the bullies hang out. Just don't go there. Don't give them the satisfaction. That's another thing to think about. Lastly, something we talked about a little bit this morning is negativity. And we need to understand that if you have a social media account, you're a user, you're not a customer. A lot of people think that they are the customers. If they have a profile on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or something like that, you're a user, and there's a distinction between the users and the customers. The customers are the big corporations paying high dollars to get your information that you give out for free from these social media platforms. And the way the social media platforms keep you linked in and addicted to their, their platforms is by having algorithm, algorithms that push the negative stuff over the positive stuff. That's because we're more drawn to negative than positive. Negative headlines get more readers. And the same is true online. And so believe it or not, the negativity is being pushed and encouraged by these social media platforms. And that's why so many of us feel bad after we go online. We see things that are disappointing. We see news that is heartbreaking and, and really scary. It's all amped up just to keep us commenting, clicking, sharing, and posting. And it's all a part of a business scheme, and we just need to be aware of what is going on. We were commanded in Philippians 4.4 to rejoice in the Lord always. And that's a responsibility that we have. We need to lead a life that is leaning towards joy. And that means getting everything out of the way that's causing us to be full of anxiety and, and depressed all the time. Social media can be a good tool, but if we don't set boundaries, it can lead to mental health issues. Okay, let's talk about physical health for a moment. Uh, probably you've never thought about this before, but there are some physical health issues as well. And at the top of the list is addiction. This gets back to the business model. It's more profitable for the people who own these uh, social media platforms to keep you addicted, to keep you online as long as possible because that's what their customers want. And so they have designed these things to keep you plugged in as long as possible. That's why it's hard to tear yourself away from it. They know how to do it. They're very good. It's a habit that a lot of us have formed. But the good news is that you can change your habits. Now, there's been some very interesting Neurological science has come out in the last few years about how the brain uh, reacts to habits. And what we found is that there are actual physical changes in the brain when you form a habit. When you do something repeatedly, or even when you think something repeatedly, neural pathways form in your brain. And uh, they get stronger and stronger. You can think about a path cut through the woods. The more you walk on it, the stronger, the deeper, the clearer it gets. Well, that's how these neural circuits in your brain work. The more you do something, the stronger it gets until it becomes automatic. This is why athletes practice. They practice until their bodies automatically do the things they want them to do. That's why musicians practice. It's called muscle memory a lot of times. And what's drawing us to pull our phone out of our pocket every four minutes or go to Facebook every time we're bored is just a habit of muscle memory. Now, the good news is that even though it's hard to change those neural pathways, they can be changed by deliberately doing different things and deliberately creating new neural pathways in your mind. And if you do a new action over and over again, the old actions get weaker and the new 
neural circuits get stronger. Uh, that's what that advice that I'm sure you've heard before is all about when it says if you do something 21 days in a row, it becomes a habit. It's more like 66 days, but it's all appealing to this idea of forming neural pathways. You can change your habits. Many of us have become addicted to our devices without even knowing it. So here are three questions I want to share with you to think about regarding addiction. And, and just ask yourself these questions. And if the answer to any of these questions is yes, you may have a problem. You may be a little too obsessed with your electronic devices. First question, am I preoccupied with social media, with the internet, with video games, or technology? Yes or no? Number two, am I unable to control my technology usage? Now those are pretty subjective, I know. Uh, I know a lot of people who aren't able to control it would say, yeah, I can control it, I just don't want to. Or, uh, no, I'm not preoccupied. What does it mean to be preoccupied? I, I'm not preoccupied. But this third question, I think, is the real test. And it's this. Do I feel distress when I'm unable to use my devices? Now, parents, you know the answer to this question when it comes to your children. When you take that phone away from them, when you take that game device away from them, what happens to their demeanor? I'm not talking about immediately when they get upset that they're not getting to use it, but over the next few hours, are they sulking? Do they know what to do with their time? Are they able to fill their hours with something other than technology? If they're not, then they're going into distress, and it shows that there's an addiction there. There's a habit that is starting to control them. Now, this, is, this is what we need to pay attention to. Addiction is very serious. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, that when somebody is overcome by something, he becomes the slave of that thing. There are good masters and there are bad masters. I don't think any of us wants to be enslaved to social media or to technology. Thirdly, let's talk about sleep deprivation. That's a physical health matter. And it's a serious problem these days. The Centers, Centers for Disease Control, uh, before all they could think about was COVID, did some studies on sleep. And they found that school-aged children get, should get 9 to 12 hours of sleep per day and that teens should get 8 to 10 hours of sleep per day. And I don't have to tell you that kids are not getting the sleep that they need. Uh, adults should get seven or more hours of sleep per day. But on average, uh, teens are getting no more than six and a half hours of sleep per day. A lot of them, of course, are getting less than that. Y you know, we talk to our daughter about this a lot. She's 16, and she tells me about friends that are sending messages at 3 a.m., and you just think, what in the world, why in the world should a kid be awake at 3 o'clock in the morning? And would they be awake if they didn't have a smartphone? And the answer to the question is no. They wouldn't have anything else to do, and they would eventually just go to bed at a decent hour. What is, what's the big deal about not getting enough sleep? Well, it can cause some serious physical problems. Sleep deprivation has been linked to obesity, to high blood pressure, to stress, loss of focus, memory loss. Without sleep, you miss out on the restorative processes that help the synapses of the brain and cognition. Uh, growth hormones develop during sleep. If you're not getting enough sleep, uh, that affects the growth hormones. The bottom line is you need sleep to be physically healthy and to be well. And the best way to ensure that technology is not uh, affecting your sleep is to not take your phone into your bedroom when you should be sleeping. Look, technology interferes with sleep in three ways. Number one, it displaces sleep time. You know, the time that you should be use, using to rest, you're on your phone. It keeps you up later at night, that's the bottom line. Number two, it causes increased emotional, cognitive, or physical stimulation 
It makes it harder to fall asleep at night. I mean, just like if you have a, a, a difficult conversation with somebody in real time, you are all wired up afterwards and it takes you a long time to wind down and go to sleep. Well, think about getting into a stressful um, confrontation online or some kind of a tweet storm or some kind of commenting debate that you get into online late at night. You can't just put your phone down and close your eyes and go to sleep. Your brain is fired up after something like that. Your blood's pumping. Your blood pressure is high. And it'll take a long time for you to fall asleep. The third thing is just the blue light illumination off these screens are messing with our circadian rhythms, which are the, the biological processes in our body that tell us when it's night or day. That blue light looks a lot like daylight, and your body is thinking it's daytime when it's nighttime. So the best thing that you can do is make a rule not to take your smartphones into the bedroom with you, not to take them, at least don't put them right next to your bed where it'll be a distraction. You can use a clock radio instead of your cell phone and, um, and try to get some sleep and try to unwind and get offline at least 30 minutes before bedtime. If you want some rest and you want to be physically healthy, these are the kinds of things, this is the kind of discipline, the boundaries that you need to set in order to get that, to attain those goals. So we've talked about mental health, we've talked about physical health. Let me take just a minute to talk about some matters pertaining to spiritual health. And the first one in this category is hatred and cruelty. Despite our sin and rebellion against God, God takes a very high view of humanity. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? We talked about how he views us. He's made us in his own image. In the words of David from Psalm 8, he's made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. He thinks so highly of us that when we condemned ourselves to death, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us. He wants us to live with him eternally in heaven. God has a very high view of humanity. And we ought to have a high view of ourselves and our fellow human beings as well. We ought to respect others and we ought to have empathy for others. Empathy is a word that means to feel the same thing the other person feels. There's something about screens when they're between us and another human being that erases our awareness that we're dealing with other people. We do things online, we say things, we hurt people online in ways that we would never do straight to their face. But what's the difference between commenting something that is hateful towards somebody and just saying it to their face? The words still hurt. They cut deeply. They're painful. And we need to think about that. We need to have empathy. Let me share some verses with you. Here's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, for uh, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and following. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And finally, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. No Christian who believes in those verses will engage in hateful communication online. Number two, under spiritual health, I want you to think about sexual immorality and impurity. Every outlet is used by the devil to tamper with impressionable minds. 
including, of course, the internet and social media. Now, all of these social media outlets have standards that they use the technology to control and uh, they promise not to put objectionable, obscene material on their platforms. But you have to understand, those standards are being set by people in the world, not by fellow Christians. And so their standards may not be what your standards are or what they should be. Now, I know it's impossible to live in this world without facing temptation. If you accidentally come across something that is sexually impure online or in person, the temptation itself is not the sin. You know, Jesus, we're told, was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. So the temptation is not a sin, but feeding the temptation, inviting the temptation, intentionally going to look for the temptation, that is sinful. And Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, when he says, I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We are inundated with sexual immorality everywhere we turn. And I want to give you four suggestions for fighting it. Now, this applies online or wherever you are. You can control yourself and keep yourself free from lust. Here's four suggestions. Number one, make a covenant with your eyes. In a list of the ways that he had been true to the Lord, Job included this. He said in Job chapter 31, verse 1, I made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look at a maiden? Job had decided as a married man, he wasn't going to look at another woman with lustful intent. Make a covenant. Decide. Set that boundary beforehand that you're going to keep yourself free from sexual impurity. Number two, do your best to avoid sinful influences. I mean, the best way to not fall to temptation is stay away from the temptation if you can. This is what the wise man says in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it, do not go on it, turn away from it, and pass on. If you're following a friend that's constantly posting things that you ought not to be seeing, unfollow that friend. You can do that. It's a very simple thing to do. Now, number three. After doing your best to avoid sinful influences, you may have to take another approach. You may have to just run. Flee fornication. That's the Bible's advice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. You can't always avoid it. Sometimes it'll come in places you least expect it. And so what do you do? You decide you're going to get away from it as fast as possible. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That was Joseph's strategy when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. He ran away and he, and he worked so hard at it that he left his garment in her hands, which got him into all kinds of trouble. But he was devoted to sexual purity. And finally, if you fail, repent. Know that everyone sins, everyone makes mistakes. When you fall to temptation, it's not the end of the road for you. There is a way back. God wants to redeem you through the blood of Jesus Christ. King David failed miserably when it came to his spiritual life. And he was riddled with spiritual disease, with sinfulness. But he repented, and God forgave him of his sin. The same can be true of you. Finally, I want to talk about language for a minute. This falls under the category of spiritual health, I think. People are not taking language and profanity as seriously today as they used to. And I think the Internet has been a big influence on this. Uh, you know, most of us stream our television programming and the movies that we watch 
And that stuff that's being, being streamed is not controlled by the FCC, like the stuff that came over the networks. And so, once again, we're left to be the one who has to discern what's good for us to take into our minds and what's not. It's had an effect on language. You know, if you've been around a long time, you know that the language is a lot coarser out there than it used to be. I mean, I hear profanity now in places where I never dreamed I'd hear it. Check out line in the grocery store. Um, shopping for clothes somewhere. Uh, somebody comes over to the house to work on the house and, and just freely and absentmindedly use language that, you know, professionals wouldn't have used in the past. You've seen it, I've seen it. And a lot of this coarsening of culture is coming to us through the, uh, the content we absorb online. Now, I've tried to think of ways to explain why your language is so important. And I don't think there's a better verse than Proverbs 25, verse 11, which says that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and fittings of silver. Words need to be appropriate. I mean, what's a bad word? It's a sound, right? Culture assigns its meaning. And our culture, our society, is what determines whether a word is fit for consumption or not. The reason we use words that are considered profane or vulgar is to shock people, to take a shortcut in getting their attention, to say things that um, shouldn't be said in order to draw the attention to ourselves in a cheap and immediate way. You know, you're so much more than shock. You are so much more interesting than foul language. Find ways to make people curious about you other than the shortcut of bad language and crude jokes. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Be known as a person that uses your words to build people up and to encourage other people. We've talked a lot about health matters, crammed a lot into this, this last uh, lesson uh, tonight. Mental health, physical health, spiritual health. And you may be thinking my whole point is to get you to throw your smartphone away or delete all your social media accounts. That's not at all what I'm asking you to do. In fact, I'd be a hypocrite if I did that. You know, I have a phone in my pocket right now. I use it for a lot of things. I wouldn't be able to get home tonight if I didn't have my smartphone. It's a very useful tool. I use it to communicate with people. I use social media to let people know what's going on and to find out what's going on in their lives. The key to all of this is just balance. Be someone who knows what your priorities are, puts God first, and makes the technology serve the priorities of your life, not set those priorities. It's all about balance. God wants you to find that equilibrium with Him at the center. Is He at the center of your life? Are you serving Him with all your heart, heart soul, and mind? Do you love Him as the number one priority in your life? Have you made that priority sure by obeying the gospel? Have you become obedient to Christ by responding to the plan of salvation? Do you need to refocus? And as we talked about this morning, do you need to renew your passion for Christ? We're gathered here tonight together. This would be a great place for us to pray with you and encourage you. Let us help you if we can. Landon's going to sing us an invitation song. If we can help you in any way, please come right now as we stand together and as we sing.